Okay, L let me start off the, the lecture on deflation, myth, and reality with a, with a question. How many of you think uh, or like uh, when prices of the things that you buy fall? Show of hands there. Oh, great. How many of you think that, the, um, that falling prices hurt businesses? Come on. Really? How many think? Okay. That's, that's good. Uh, and how, how, many think, uh, how many of you think that falling prices hurt the, uh, the economy? Okay. Okay. Good. All right. I guess I don't have to give the lecture. Everybody knows the correct answers, so it's superfluous. Um, so uh, what I want to do is, is to talk about the myths and reality, uh, or myth and reality uh, involved with, with deflation. So, so let me start off by talking a little bit about what, what deflation used to mean and what it has come to mean. It used to mean a decrease in the money supply, period, end of story. Okay? Uh, money supply is a volume. Deflation is, is a, a reduction of the volume of something. Towards the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century, deflation that began to mean the movement in the money supply relative to the movement in the supply of goods and services in the economy. So if, if the economy grew by 5%, but the money supply only grew by 3%, that was considered deflationary, okay? Um, because prices fell. And then by, by the time of Jane, John Maynard Keynes in the 30s and later, uh, deflation ca came to mean, especially after World War II, just came to mean a change in prices. The, the focus on the money supply completely dropped out. There's another word that I had coined in the early 2000s, and it was called uh, deflation phobia. Okay, so what, what did it mean? Well, it's basically a morbid and irrational fear of, of deflation. Now, central bankers love to promote this fear. And this occurred in the United States. Pretty much deflation had dropped out of the American lexicon, um, except as an historical illusion. Okay, by, by the 1960s, uh, no one really talked about deflation or was worried about deflation. Everyone thought that the Fed could always prevent the deflation. But then suddenly, in the early 2000s, the Greenspan Fed began to stoke the f American fears, the fears of the American public uh, about deflation. Okay, they began to actively promote deflation phobia. So there was a, a sort of a trial balloon speech made in 2002 by Ben Bernanke, Helicopter Ben. There he is, just you know, throwing money into the air and into the American economy. And it was given to a, to, to a group of, a prestigious group of, of, of businessmen. Um, and it was called deflation, making sure it doesn't happen here. So he goes through uh, in the speech how, why it could never happen here, will never happen again after the Great Depression. We know how to stop it. But at the end, if you see the bolded part of the statement, it says, so having said that deflation in the United States is highly unlikely, I would be imprudent to rule out the possibility altogether. Okay, so, so he's opening the door now. Okay, well now, the U.S. economy was in a recession. You know, 9-11 had just occurred. Uh, we were just starting to come out a little bit. The Fed would like, would, really wanted to gun the money supply, really pour money into the economy. So then in April, Greenspan, um, in his usual Fed speak, which is very difficult to understand, very circuitous way of, of, of speaking, um, before Congress, he said that a further drop in inflation would be an unwelcome development. And, and the newspapers went crazy. Okay, uh-oh, De deflation is, is, is around the corner. And later on in a press conference, um, in April, he said, we see no credible possibility that we will at any point run out of monetary ammunition to address problems of deflation. Well, who's, who's worried about that? All of a sudden, he's starting to unilaterally um, uh, uh, bring into the picture deflation. Okay, don't worry, we will never run out of ammunition. Well, who said anything about deflation to begin with? There was no deflation in the U.S. economy at that point. We had a, a, low, a, a low rate of inflation, not compared to the 1950s, but compared to the 1970s and 1980s, our, our, our rate of inflation was, uh, of inflation was low. Um, but so there, you, 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 there it began, okay, in, in April of that year, 2002, um, of 2003, excuse me, 
uh, this concern being expressed very gravely and solemnly by the central bank about deflation. So the media immediately jumped on this, of course, and they promoted the, the deflation story. Uh, they had, I went back and looked at, at some of the headlines of blog posts and, and articles, and it had very lurid titles. The deflation monster still lives. These are headlines. The specter of deflation. Why we should fear deflation. The deflation boogeyman haunts Fed. The greatest threat facing the U.S. economy, deflation. We hadn't had any, for crying out loud. Defeating deflation. The deflation dilemma, to be concerned or not to be. Okay. Now I'm concerned that I can't change this. Uh, let me see. Oh, there we go. Okay. So what causes deflation? Okay, from the Austrian perspective. Okay, I'll talk, talk, talk a little bit about that. Um, like the price of any other good, the value of money is determined by the supply and demand. Okay? And in the case of, uh, of, the, uh, of, of money, uh, an increase in the demand for money can come from two sources. It can come from an increase in the amount of goods and services that people uh, have produced and, are, and want to sell in exchange for money. That's called an exchange demand for money. Or it can come from people wanting to hold more money and exchange fewer dollars for, for goods and services. So in either of those cases, or in both of those cases together, you'd have an increase in demand and an increase in the value of money, because deflation is really just another word for um, uh, uh, the value of, uh, or an increase in the value of money. Sometime in, the, in the 19th century, it used to be called an appreciation of money and a depreciation of money. So the bad thing was a depreciation of money, the inflation. The appreciation of money was an increase in the value of money. Okay, so things were looked at a little differently under the gold standard. And of course, we could have an, uh, a deflation as a result, a deflation in the modern sense of a change in the price level um, as a result of a reduction in the supply of money. Okay? This rarely occurs today. Okay? That is, um, if banks fail and people's savings and, and checking accounts disappear into thin air as they did um, in the early 1930s, that would be a, a decrease in supply of money that reduced prices and caused the, the value of money to rise. Um, on the other hand, the Fed could decrease the, the supply of money in, in, in the economy, okay, through uh, open market operations, through selling bonds and absorbing in exchange for, 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 for uh, bank reserves. Okay, but that, uh, we'll, we'll come to that when we, when we talk a little bit about the 1920s at the end of this lecture. So what are the kinds of deflation? Okay, so I've identified a number of different kinds of, of deflation in an article I wrote right after this, this episode had occurred. Um, and so the first is growth deflation. The second is cash building. That is, people wanting to hold more cash in relation to their income and in relation to the things that they, they buy, their, their, their spending. It's also known as speculative deflation. Because when people increase their, their, the holding of money to any great extent, it's because they expect prices to fall in the future whether it's households doing the increasing of, 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 of holding money or, or businesses. Okay? And then a third kind of deflation, which I'm not going to get into in this lecture, what I call, and I, I named confiscatory deflation, that's where governments demonetize uh, you know, certain types of currency, certain bills and notes, uh, as they did in India a few years back, uh, or where they, they actually prevent depositors from withdrawing money from, or, or put a limit on how much money depositors can withdraw from their checking accounts, okay, and savings accounts, okay. But the first two kinds are sort of a natural outgrowth of the, uh, of the monetary economy, and uh, they're nothing to be worried about. They're what we call benign inflation, or good, inf uh, I'm sorry, benign deflation, or good deflation. Um, even Fed economists agree that the first kind of deflation, growth deflation, okay, um, a number of them now are saying that that's a good kind of deflation. So, but, but the majority of economists think any sort of fall in the price level is a bad thing and is malignant and, and is hurtful to the economy. So I want to address the first myth. If the money supply does not grow fast enough, okay, this is the myth, prices will fall and it will stifle or strangle economic growth, okay? What's the reality? Falling prices are the, the natural effect of rapid growth uh, of economic output due to improving technology and an increase 
in uh, investment and, and the accumulation of capital. Okay. Um, on that, if you have that on the one hand, this, 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 this ra fairly rapid growth in output, uh, and you have a sound money like a gold standard, which is a market-based money, and the market restrains the, uh, the cost of production of, of, of new gold, okay, is, is, is dampened by, by the fact that it's very costly to, t to dig gold out of the ground, well then, what you usually get in a capitalist economy is the supply of goods and services growing more rapidly than the supply of money, in, meaning that the prices are going to fall and the value of money will rise. Okay? And that's our experience, as I'll show you in a moment, under the gold standard. In the U.S. and um, throughout the sort of industrial world in the 19th century. So uh, growth deflation uh, is basically caused by what I've, I've just told you. Uh, the, there's an increase in production, supply of goods and services in the economy that's usually called economic growth. Um, it's caused by improvements in technology, which are then embodied in new and better capital goods. Okay. And um, the in increased supply of goods represents an increase in the exchange demand for money. People are competing for more dollars. So if the, uh, if, if the supply of money is fixed and there are more goods to be sold against dollars, then the prices of the goods are going to, going to go down. Um, so um, if, as the supply of gold increased very slowly, we, we found that in the 19th century that prices tended to fall, okay? Fairly gently. It wasn't a rapid decline in prices that we faced. So growth deflation occurred in the United States and other market economies throughout the 19th century. And the reason was we had a market-based money, the gold standard. Um, economic growth exceeded the growth of the supply of, of money in the economy. And this was a good deflation because it was a natural uh, outgrowth of, of the capitalist economy. So just to give you an example, from 1880 to 1896, prices fell by 30% over that period, which is about 1.75%. So even if you didn't get a raise in your, in your salary or wages, a nominal raise, you still had uh, an increase in your real income and your real living standards. Uh, real GDP grew in the face of, of the 30% fall in prices over those years. A real GDP grew by 85% or 5% or per year. So the 1880s gave us the highest decadal rate of growth in U.S. history. Okay. Um, if we extend the period and go back to 1870, when we began to, to deflate the money supply um, and take, take the greenbacks, the paper money that was um, created to, to finance the Civil War, when, when that was being withdrawn from the U.S. economy, we started 18, in 1870. Um, and go to uh, 1898, we find that wholesale prices drop by 34%, um, okay, a 1.7% annual rate of decline, and consumer prices fell by almost 5%, uh, I'm sorry, 47%, or 2.5% annually. So we see the U.S. Is, is really being transformed from an agricultural economy right after the Civil War into one of the major, or the, the major industrial power in the U.S. by 19, uh, in the world by 1914. Okay, so um, real gross national product grew during the, those, 20, uh, those 18, 18, 28 years um, by 4.5%, and consumption, people's standards of living were growing 2.3% every year. And there you can see it graphically, okay? So uh, if you look at the peak here in 1819, um, that was due to banks of creating money, fractional reserve banks, creating money um, to, to finance uh, the War of 1812, okay, that, that run up in prices. And then when, 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 when we had the Panic of 1819, which Murray Rothbard wrote a book on, um, things began to return to normal and prices fell by 53%, okay? And then we had, the, uh, around 1860, we had the beginning of the greenback inflation. Those were the dollars that the government printed up um, to finance a civil war, the paper dollars, unbacked by gold. And we had a huge inflation, and then prices fell back to pretty much what they were before the war, okay, by, by uh, 1896 or in 1900. Okay. Um, so prices gently fell over time, okay. 
By 1879, all the greenbacks had been withdrawn, but we still saw a fall in prices, and that was the growth deflation, okay? From, from 1870 to 1879, that was a, a decrease in the supply of money that was brought about by retiring the greenbacks, taking them out of circulation and contracting the money supply. But yet, from 1880, going up to about 1896, when we started to get a small gold inflation, uh, we, we had uh, this growth deflation. Okay. okay, so let's look at recent examples of, of growth deflation. We'll, we'll take a look at uh, laser eye, uh, LASIK eye surgery, um, TV sets, and um, computers. Okay. Now, all of these industries have, um, have, have, have grown tremendously. And yet prices, as I'll show you, have fallen, okay? And they haven't fallen by insignificant amounts. They, they fell significantly in all of these industries. So these industries were flourishing, okay? increasing their output, increasing their employment, and so on. Um, so let's take a look at mainframe computers. So a mainframe computer in, four point, uh, in, in 1970, um, an IBM computer cost $4.7 million. Today, PCs are 20 times faster and uh, they have more memory, and they sell for less than $500, okay? That's, uh, that's amazing. So the quality has improved tremendously. Prices have, have, have plummeted. Uh, from eight, 1980 to 1999, prices fell by about 90%. Um, but what happened to the size of the industry? Was it stifled because prices were falling? Um, did it have bankruptcies and so on? Well, it had some bankruptcies, but only for in inefficient firms. The other firms that were efficient were growing tremendously. So between um, 1980 and 1999, shipments went from about a half a million PCs to 43 million. And then by 2013, shipments of PCs were up to 315 million shipped. So in the face of, of, of these sharply declining prices, this industry expanded and flourished. Okay. If you look at the memory prices, they went from $6.48 per megabyte in 1980 to uh, less than one cent per megabyte uh, by 2014. And I don't know what they are, what they are now. And here is a graph showing the decline in, in hard drive prices. Okay, so if you, if you look back in the early 1980s, some of these hard drives were selling for a million dollars, okay? Today, they're selling for un under 10, 10 cents, okay, per gigabyte, right? Um, and just to give you an example, graphical example, or a, a, viv a vivid example, um, on the left, you see eight 2.5 gigabyte IBM f f um, disk systems, okay? So um, the estimated value is six, between $648,000 and $1,137,000. The weight was 4,400 4, pounds. It took up a, a large part of one of these walls, okay? Uh, by 2010, we have um, three micro SD cards, uh, 32 gigabytes, estimated value between $100 and $150, the weight half a gram, okay? And then they're, they're even, so you get an idea how small they are in, in the right image there. Okay, once again, the computer industry, despite the fall in all of, uh, of the various inputs, prices of, of, uh, of their outputs, rather, um, flourished, okay? They didn't collapse. Um, HD, let's look at HDTV. In 2004, there were 32 million television sets sold in North America for an average price of $400 with an average size of 27 inches. By 2015, 44 million sets were sold, so an expansion in the industry, large expansion uh, in, in North America. And the average price is $460, but the average size is 38 inches. So the, and the quality was much better, okay? There are more pixels per square inch. Um, but anyway, the price per diagonal inch fell from a 1481 to 12. 10, and during this era, prices of everything else was going up, okay? So 
So the long-term fall in price of HDTVs, an HDTV in Japan in 1990 sold for $36,000, okay? By 2003, they were between $3,000 and $5,000, and then today you, know, you can get them for, for less than, than $500. Okay, so these are all parts of the economy. Okay, in individual industries, fall in prices does not discourage entrepreneurship, um, the, the increase in output, the uh, increase in uh, the improvement in technology, and so on. Okay. In fact, it's an outcome of all of these things. And so I'll, I'll give you the last example. Um, LASIK eye surgery. In 1998, it was $4,000 per eye to get your vision corrected. By 2013, it was $300 per eye. Okay. Botox treatment. Notice, by the way, where government's not involved in, in health care, where it's cosmetic health care, which you know, is not insured and the government's not involved in it, um, prices fall. Okay? We don't have an increase in, in, in health care costs in these areas of completely elective surgeries and so on and procedures. So a Botox treatment um, was $365 in, in 2001. And by 2013, it was between 99 and 149 on discount websites. Liposuction went from uh, 1600 over 1600 in 1992 to $999 on discount websites. And again, in the face of inflation, we had a continuing inflation during this period when these prices were falling. So the real prices are falling by even more. OK, so to, to sum up growth inflation, growth inflation is a way to allow firms who, who, who have cut their cost of production because they're, 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 they're so eager to earn profits to sell the additional output. So as, as the prices of, you know, of, of, of hard drives and all these things, these, these inputs into computers are falling, um, firms are, 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 are you know, just looking at these high profits that they can earn by selling more of these computers because their costs of production are, set, are falling. And they're all doing the same thing. They're all, they're all producing more. And in order to, to, to get consumers to purchase more because of the downward sloping demand curve, you have to allow prices to fall. It's a natural outcome of technological improvement and the accumulation of capital. So let's look at the second um, myth about deflation. And that is that deflation prolongs and intensifies recession and turns a mild recession into a great depression. Right. What's the reality? The reality is that deflation is a cure for a recession and speeds up the adjustment of the economy, okay? um, allows it to recover more fully and, and more quickly. And it also prevents recessions from degenerating in, into, into depressions, as we'll see. So this is um, the result, this sort of, of, of um, what we call speculative cash holding or ca uh, cash building is a result of businessmen during a recession noticing that, look, the, the wage rates and other, other types of, of uh, input prices have been bid up above what prices are going to be in the future. So they naturally withhold the purchase of these things, okay, because they're, they're, the, the profit margins have disappeared and, and they, they're looking forward to losses, okay? So as, as Professor um, Newman told us yesterday, um, in the case of, of business cycles, at the peak of the business cycle, you have the wage rates being much higher than they were when, when the business cycle, when the boom started, and the, the wage rates are, um, uh, because, because the Fed has stepped on the brakes and, and brought about um, at least a, a slowing down of the increase in the money supply, and uh, maybe even a reversal, a contraction of the money supply. Uh, because of that, you have businesses see seeing that their prices are falling, but yet these, wa these wage rates and costs have not, have not yet fallen. So by holding money and, and, uh, in a free market economy, what that does by reducing the expenditures on these factors of production, it brings down their prices. Okay. Um, so they're speculating that wage rates will soon come down, and they will come down because the demand for, the, for, 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 for labor is falling. Now, if, 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 if government intervention doesn't counteract that, okay, that will be the natural uh, effect. So, um, so entrepreneurs really are, are showing a preference for holding cash 
uh, and waiting until wages and other input prices come down, okay, before they begin to invest again. And the more rapidly the prices fall, the, the more quickly investment starts again, and, and the economy does not, uh, you know, decline further into a, into a depression, or what's sometimes called a secondary depression. Um, now, let me just say one thing here. Um, the, the prices will fall further than they, in some sense, need to, or, or, or a, a certain economists observers believe need to be the case. So, so certain, both Austrian economists and, and especially Chicago economists, claim that this additional fall in prices because people are holding money at the trough of, of the recession will cause uh, the, the recession to deepen. No, it doesn't. What it causes is some prices to deflate, okay? And that deflation restores profit margins and restores, as long as those, the, the, those prices stay low, it restores the confidence of entrepreneurs in their ability to forecast the future. They now see profit margins, and they see that they've, that they've stayed there for a while, that, that these wages are staying low, and so that's when they be, are, are spurred or stimulated into investing again, all right? So the deflation, you might want to call it a secondary deflation. It's certainly not a secondary depression. Secondary deflation is, is exactly what's needed to restore what's, what, what we know is called the, the natural rate of interest, the rate of price margins or differences between the different stages of production, between your product and, 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 and the, uh, cost, uh, the cost of production of that product. So def deflation, in that sense, speeds up the readjustment of the input prices to output prices. Um, let, me, let me just circle back to that one more time. Remember, when the economy crashes, uh, and people have not been anticipating this, entrepreneurs start to doubt themselves, okay? There's a certain malaise that, that, that settles over the business world, okay? A certain psychological state of pessimism, where they, they're second-guessing themselves, and they're also second-guessing the market. So... Until prices or until the cost of production fall tremendously and, and almost force them to, 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 to reinvest, they're, they're not, they're not going to come out of this state of, of, of psychological pe pe pessimism. All right? So pessimism it doesn't cause recessions, but it is, it is an effect of recessions. And, and the re way to reverse it is allow prices to readjust as quickly as possible. Okay? I think it's a very important point, so I want to reinforce that. Um, and then the same thing is true with households, that we don't have to go through it in too much detail. Um, you know, people who are going to buy cars within, you know, imminently or, you know, in the next few months, uh, or household appliances or, or ho new homes, um, once they, 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 they become uncertain about their jobs, if, if they don't actually lose their jobs, uh, or they, they have a wage freeze or their bonuses are um, cut uh, or done away with, they, they will begin to, to, to worry about the future. And in doing so, that, the, the, to, 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 um, to respond to that, what, what they'll do is they'll, they'll build up cash. They'll stop spending as much as they have been before. And that will bring the prices down of consumer goods even more quickly and bring, a, and, and, and bring about an, an increase in spending eventually, okay, when, when their confidence returns. So let's look at the um, forgotten depression. Okay, and it was it was actually in some some books and, and writings was called was called the Great Depression, the Depression of 1920-21. So there was an inflationary boom to, to finance um, the U.S. lending to, 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 to and, and also the U.S. expenditures during World War One. So uh, the Fed had been created in 1914, and, and, and the Fed was doing certain things like cutting reserve requirements and um, uh, lending to banks and so on. And so they were expanding the money supply even before the U.S. entered the war. And then when the U.S. entered the war, they began to, to, to purchase government bonds um, and increase the money supply for even further to finance the war. So from 1915 to 1919, uh, the Fed increased the money supply by about 15.5% per year. Um, U.S. prices responded by increasing by about the same uh, percentage per year. Um, and then from 17 to, to 1917 to 1920, you can see consumer prices um, increased by 14.1% per year. Okay. So general prices, consumer prices were all, all, all skyrocketing during this period. 
And then we got the deep depression, all right? Uh, the Fed stopped increasing the money supply, cut back on, on, on its increase in the money supply. And what happened was that nominal GDP, that is total spending in the economy on, on, on new goods and services, uh, fell by one quarter. The economy shrunk to 75% of its previous size in one year. Okay, So from 1920 to 1921, it fell, it fell from total spending in the economy, fell from $91 billion to $69 billion. Uh, re, real GNP shrank by about 9%. That is 10% of the economy just disappeared, okay, of the real economy, okay, between 20 and 21. And an unemployment reached 15.3% in 1921, okay, so a very high rate of unemployment. Okay, so the deflation was very steep. Money supply grew 2.9% uh, only in 1920, after growing 15% per year up to that point. So the Fed tightened the money supply sharply, okay, and in fact contracted it by 7.5% in 1920. So we had a sharp monetary deflation, okay, and it was, it was deliberate. Uh, and as a result, general prices fell by uh, 16 uh, over 16% in 1921, and uh, by 8% in 1922. Consumer prices fell by 10.9% uh, in 21, 6.3% in 22. So we, we see a sharp decline in prices. In fact, wholesale prices were cut in half, okay, from mid-20 to mid-21. A very sharp fall. Now, these are, are, are basically commodity prices, uh, you know, that are that are that can decline, that are very very flexible and, and move up and down very very rapidly. Wages fell, so even wages fell by 11%, okay, nominal wages. And that comes from Jim Grant's uh, book, which I recommend. Um, he's a very good writer. It's written, f you know, for, for a, a popular audience. Uh, the Forgotten Depression, 1921, The Crash That Cured Itself, okay. Um, so let's compare the two, two depressions. Um, in the first... Uh, we, we got very rapid recovery. Deflation and laissez-faire government policy quickly cured the depression. The depression ended by August 1921, only 18 months after it had begun. And I wish I had put a, this slide in there, but people, economists in the Fed, mainstream economists, almost there's like 10 or 11 quotes from, from, from these economists who were mainstream or they were uh, Fed economists. They all said that what we need is liquidation. Okay, and, and what they meant by liquidation was that things must be sold at the prices, at market prices during the Depression. All prices must adjust. They were all liquidationists, you know, whether, whether they were sort of left progressive economists or, you know, centrist economists or, or economists who were, were sort of more free market. They, they all saw that the road to recovery was, was through liquidation. The only economists that, that objected to this and claimed that it was going to cause the recession to, to, to um, be prolonged was John Maynard Keynes and um, uh, the Swedish economist uh, Castle or Cassell. Okay? And they were the two who wanted to stabilize prices. And, and their, unfortunately, their arguments won out over these other economists. Okay? Uh, it, it, things really changed in the 1920s, and, and the Fed began to um, follow the advice of Keynes and uh, Cassell, and uh, there was a third economist wh whose name I forget now. But they were all wrong about the end of the recession, but yet their advice was followed. Okay, the Great Depression, on the other hand, lasted from 1929 to 1940, and we know why. Governments interfered uh, uh, tremendously throughout the economy. Uh, they had minimum wages, forced collective bargaining. Uh, uh, this is the US, just the U.S. We had price supports for farm products. We had the destruction of the gold standard, moving off the gold standard, devaluation of the dollar, monetary expansion, higher taxes, higher tariffs, and so on. So Mises called the Great Depression not a regular recession or, or depression. He called it the crisis of interventionism. Okay? It was a result of government intervention and not allowing the adjustment of the economy to occur, a large part of which comes through deflation. So the, very interesting, uh, the Keynesian view, even at the height of Keynesian economics, uh, of the 1920-21 Depression, um, 
there's a famous, uh, well, he used to be famous in the 60s and 70s, Robert A. Gordon, who was a, a Keynesian expert on business cycles. And he wrote a few books on business cycles. It's actually interesting uh, on historical business cycles. And he has some int very interesting information in those books. Um, but here's what he wrote uh, about the 2021 dep depression. He was, he, he was you know, puzzled by it. He, he, wrote, he wrote, the downswing was severe, but relatively short. Its outstanding feature was the extreme decline in prices. Government policy to moderate the depression and speed recovery was minimal. Okay, it's the actual opposite. Okay, to amplify the recession, okay, and, and to slow, it, slow down the recovery if the government actually did interfere. He, so he goes on, the Federal Reserve authorities were largely passive, nor was any use made of fiscal policy. The federal budget was deflationary, meaning that they actually had a surplus during, during this recession, while the downswing was in progress. Despite the absence of a stimulative government policy, however, recovery was not long delayed. So I, you know, I'm, I read the rest of the, you know, he doesn't explain why or what he thinks of it or what, what, why does he think this occurred, okay? But he, he's just confused by it. Okay, uh, myths and reality three sort of sums up the first two in a way. Uh, and, and takes a look at uh, the, a look at the empirical data. Um, so the myth is that the empirical evidence indicates a strong link between deflation and depression. That was the mes message of uh, of the book by uh, Milton Friedman uh, um, on um, the uh, monetary history of the United States, which was published, uh, I think, the same year as America's Great Depression, 1963, I believe. Um, and in Friedman's book. He claims we can forget about all you know all these other causes, the, the causes the Keynesians were claiming, you know, fallen spending, a collapse of, of the stock market, which caused a, a, a negative wealth effect. He says, no, that, that, that wasn't it. Nor what, what, what was the Austrian explanation correct. Um, the reason why we had a, a, a depression uh, in the 1930s was because the Fed allowed a, what, he, what Friedman called a garden variety recession, which would have been very shallow and and, and and over quickly to turn into a, a deep depression by allowing a, a one-third collapse in the money supply, okay? So since that time, most economists have come over to the Friedman view. And Ben Bernanke, a few years ago, before Friedman died in 2006, um, sort of fetid Friedman and said, you were right, and we all believe it now, and the Fed believes it. And this was right before the a, a great, um, uh, the, the um, Great Recession hit the U.S. after the financial crisis um, in 2006. And, and, and the Fed responded as Friedman would have wanted them to, okay, by providing liquidity to the economy. But what's the reality? Okay, so recent empirical studies have shown that aside from the Great Depression um, from 29 to 34, there is no empirical evidence of a link between deflation and depression. Uh, the Great Depression is an outlier in major empirical data, uh, empirical studies that show no that shows no statistically and economically significant link between falling prices and falling output. Um, so the deflation phobia of these modern mainstream economists like Greenspan, Krugman, Bernanke, Yellen, um, really just rests on on the Great Depression. Okay, so let me just show you the two studies very quickly. Here you see that it doesn't seem to be a correlation, right, between what's happening to prices and what's happening um, to that uh, the solid line up top there, okay, that's, that's output, okay? And prices are going down in the 1800s, yet output is, 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 is moving, moving up very, very speedily and, and quickly. Um, and there's really, if you just look, just eyeball it, there's not a, there's not a, a, a big link between um, what, what's happening to prices and what's happening to output from 1804 to 2015. But let's look at it a little, little more deeply. There was a study in 2004 by two economists, Atkinson and Kehoe, deflation and depression, is there an empirical link? Um, um, many economists attacked it and, and tried to ignore it. But uh, they studied 16 countries over 100 years or more, broken down to five-year periods, sort of arbitrarily, and covering 73 deflation episodes and 29 depression episodes. And guess what? There's not much overlap. So what they found was, excluding the Great Depression, 
Ackerson and Kehoe find that 65 of 73 deflation episodes involved no depression, okay? While 21 of 29 depression episodes were not associated with deflation. So in other words, 90% of deflation episodes did not result in, in a depression. Uh, they conclude, um, the data suggests that deflation is not closely related to depressions. A broad historical look finds more periods of deflation with reasonable growth than with depression, and many more, peri many more periods of depression with inflation than with deflation. Overall, the data show virtually no link between deflation and depression. Now, an even better study was done in, in the Corley Journal of Austrian Economics by Pavel Riska, who has written a, a long dissertation on this, and there's, and there's much more in his dissertation. He tries to go into micro-episodes of, of deflation. But for now, um, let's just take a look at his um, studies of, 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 of deflation in general and the link between depression and deflation. So what he studied 20 countries from 1804 to 2015 using annual data, not broken up arbitrarily into five-year periods. Um, there are 3,293 observations in his study, uh, and which have readings for both price and, and output growth. 72% um, of all annual observations saw inflation, and 28% and saw either zero or negative deflation. Okay, so you have a mix of, 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 of different data. So you, have, you have many years where there are observations for, for deflation, fewer years, but still a lot of years where there's observations on, on deflation. So what did they find? The average annual output growth rate for inflationary years was 2.85%, and for deflationary years, 2.73%. Um, the difference between the growth rates, though, was not statistically significant at any level of, of significance, okay? Um, nor was the difference in, in the variances, the, the, the volatility of output growth in the two cases. So... Uh, I'll, I'll skip over that. We don't get into that. But look, what's his conclusion? Um, he concludes that the Great Depression stands out as the only episode in the sample with both a, a statistically significant and economically important positive relationship between output and prices. When one leaves out the Great Depression, which represents only 90 out of 2,158 observations, he drops some of the other observations, um, using the regressions, Correlations between inflation and output growth in the rest of the sample lose their significance entirely. So that's the regression line for those who have taken statistics. There's zero correlation between output growth um, and inflation. Okay, But if you look at the Great Depression episode, there is, there is correlation. That's the only episode in which there, there is a, any sort of a positive correlation between deflation and depression, which means that all, all of this deflation phobia traces back to this one episode during which the government intervened tremendously and, and, and pervasively throughout the economy. So here, of course, they're mistaking, mistaking a, a garden variety recession for a full-blown crisis of interventionism. Okay, so I'll, um, I will stop here. Thank you. So, so we all should be deflation filiacs, deflation lovers, deflation filia. <laughs> <laughs>